Yeah, hi, and welcome to my talk, Crafting Comics for Literally Everyone. In the next half an hour, I want to talk with you about how we can create cool, immersive experiences on the web that are literally accessible for everyone. And we look at into JavaScript applications, single page applications, which kind of like constraints we actually have if you want to make these applications accessible as part of our art experiences, and also what kind of tools and APIs we can use nowadays to actually make this a good experience as we actually move on. My name is Jessica Jordan. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as jjordan underscore dev, and I'm also a senior front end engineer at Simple Apps. Uh, we are a consultancy that specializes in JavaScript, Ruby and Rails, and Phoenix Elixir. If you would like to learn more about what we're up to, feel free to talk to me after this talk. But let's actually get into the topic. The topic of comics is actually really close to my heart because as maybe many of you in the audience as well, like since I was a little kid, I was like super in love with comics. I really like to follow the stories of my favorite heroes and favorite villains as well in these uh, comic book stories. And back then it was actually like this very straightforward approach. Maybe you also remember you just went to your corner store or your bookstore and you would actually get like one of these magazines and sometimes even share them with your friends. And back then, when print comics were just like the thing that you had to use when you wanted to read like comic stories, um, there were actually a couple of constraints that came into your mind like as a 10-year-old when you actually wanted to follow up. Um, and some of them included that you actually had to have physical assets. So you would have to kind of like buy a book somewhere, maybe several books, carry them around and yeah, I don't know, like as a 10-year-old, it's like usually fine to do this, right? But it wasn't actually like this accessible in this regard. Then also the portability concerns is like something that comes into mind, like with actually carrying around the books. But last but not least, like something that when I was younger, never really thought about, but that actually is a very big barrier when you look at like traditional printed comic books, is the fact that you, as a 10-year-old, you actually have to be cited to read them. And I think back then I never thought about it, but thinking about the topic more and about like comics that I actually want to create, I thought about it a little bit more in depth and was like so amazed by this idea that up until this point I never thought about like all the kids that couldn't actually read the books themselves because they were blind or maybe had low vision and only could experience all of these stories about like their favorite heroes by narratives of their sighted friends. Um, Maybe when they were lucky, there would be a movie adaptation like 10 years later and they could actually listen to this one. Or maybe like an audiobook adaptation that came out later. But as with the traditional comic book format, it was never really possible for a blind kid, for example, to actually read these stories. And I looked into it a little bit more. I was like, hmm, like, this seems actually pretty obvious once you think about this. So probably someone already out there also thought about it and tried to overcome this hurdle. And in fact, there were already a lot of different people who tried to make comic books accessible for literally everyone. There's, for example, this really cool art project by Philip Meyer, which is called Life. And this is a very interesting haptic experience for both sighted and blind users. They can actually read each panel by using the hands, and this kind of punctured texture that is applied to the paper makes it possible to figure out the images and the figures that are depicted in each panel by just using your hands by your haptic senses. On the other hand, Comics in Power is also a great initiative. I want to mention at this point, it's a comic book store for the blind, and it allows readers to actually immerse themselves in the comic book worlds of their favorite heroes by using the audio format. And in contrast to the traditional audiobook, this one actually tries to emphasize the comic book experience from the first page when you actually open the book. It even describes to you how glossy the cover is when you actually hold it in your hands and how it actually feels like to see this first page for yourself. And all of the comics that are published by Comics in Power are also narrated by a single voice actor, making it a little more personal experience, making you feel like it is kind of like your inner voice actually talking back to you while you read the comic, as if you were a sighted reader. And I think this is really amazing. You should definitely check it out if you want to learn more about it. And last but not least, I also want to highlight another example of accessible web comics. Um, this is like an interesting comic series by Christopher B. Wright uh, called Evis Serati. And he actually makes a point that each time when he actually uploads an image for a comic strip that is new on his website, 
to also upload a transcript that actually describes each single scenario in every panel and also what the characters are actually talking about. So this makes an image format that is usually not accessible, directly accessible by providing the related transcript, so screen reader users can actually make sense of it as well. And all of these examples are pretty great. And I was thinking to myself, well, if I wanted to make like a comic myself, like there are already like a really cool ideas how I could actually get started. And I also realized by looking at these examples, there's this one format, like this one dimension of our senses that we can really make much more use of when we actually want to make comic book experience more accessible. And this is like the audio spectrum of our experience of the world. And by using the audio format, I actually have also on the web a very good leverage to make use of it, as we will see later. And this is something I also wanted to take a further look into. Also, just like thinking about where I want to get started, I was thinking it would be really cool if I actually had like a cool web app that I could create to publish my own comic book. And I was thinking it would be really cool to have like a single page JavaScript application because I feel it would be really nice to have a very snippy user interface for sighted users and that it feels like very fluid. I was thinking it would be nice to build it with Ember.js, not only because I already have like a full tool set to get started with my application, including routing, a data solution, a state management solution, but also this is something that I already have a lot of experience with. And I also wanted to have a way, using a JavaScript application, to have animations and interactivity tied to each other and make this a more immersive and interesting experience for sighted users. Looking at accessibility, though, I realized, well, like there might actually be some couple kind of constraints which we'll look into in just a bit. And some of them, for example, included the idea that how do I actually narrate the story to blind users, for example? How do I actually make the story that is usually only captured in images accessible to those? And I was thinking it would be really cool if I also had a transcript similar to the SVRAT example we saw early on, but it should be embedded into my story. And by navigating from panel to panel, like um, screen reader user, for example, could still follow the story, but a sighted user would still get the very same experience as a blind user, and therefore I didn't would have to duplicate like all of the content. And by actually making use of screen readers to actually let the screen reader um, actually do the work for um, assistive technology users while reading the comic, I also can kind of recreate this idea that an inner voice is actually reading back to the reader as they are going through the page. And this sounded really interesting to me. So I was thinking, okay, so I now have this image, and actually this image is not visible now, so to speak metaphorically, to the screen reader user. Instead, like, they don't actually get anything out of the page if I just like, upload an image. Um, of course, if I use like, image tags, I can use the alt attribute to append any kind of like, transcript that is related to this image. And also using the area label, I have another way to, if I'm, for example, not able to use an image tag, to declare anything that might be relevant for a screen reader user uh, in the scope of this certain image. And using semantic HTML, I also realized there's a lot of cool ways that I can actually embed text, so for example, speech that is used by characters in my comic stories without having to do like extra work. I can just use semantic HTML and it works out of the box. We will see later on how this actually plays out. In my case, for example, I use a layered approach to my comic panels, so each single panel may consist of several layers of imagery that can be animated independently of, of each other. And thinking about this, I thought it would actually be really nice to still keep all of these imageries together in one single element, in one single component, for example, but still have a way to narrate what is happening in this singular unit of content. And Using, for example, an article tag and then also appending a background image, I don't have the ability just to use the alt attribute, but using the role tag for declaring images and also the area label, I again have the ability to directly say, well, this stack of images that you have right now here and this single component should be narrated with the text, for example, a person currently struggles to sail in a boat. And this way, I can actually make use of a lot of like, cool techniques for sighted users to have interesting animations in a single panel, but still have the possibility to make it accessible for users who might visit my website with a screen reader. 
Of course, if you have the possibility to use an image tag, uh, feel free to do so. This is something that HTML just gives you out of the box without having to do any extra work, and this is something to keep in mind. Also, thinking about semantic HTML, I realized if I actually try to make the HTML play in my favor, I also don't have to do any extra work either. By, for example, using p tags, paragraph tags, for any kind of speech that my character uses, I can also make sure that this is read by screen readers as it should, and also the screen reader user can already estimate how they should actually navigate the page and what they should actually make out of this certain content. By making sure that I not only put a div on everything, this is something that I get just like for free out of the box by using semantic HTML. And let's actually have a look how this plays out, right? So um, later on, I will also talk a little bit about yeah, why I think it's actually really important to um, use screen readers on what you're building. Um, I just want to briefly highlight how this would actually sound like. Um, and let's actually have a look at this. So I'm, for example, like on a Mac, and uh, therefore I can already make use of this uh, free um, screen reader tool called VoiceOver. Some of you might have already used it for testing, and Welcome if you, for example, Voice look for on. it, like system preferences, system preferences, accessibility, window, accessibility features, then you can just over. enable it. Selected has keyboard focus. It tells you a lot of things first. Space with Brave containing window crafting comics for literally everyone. Talk slides by Jessica Jordan. Brave, full screen space. Brave, I click here to enter main navigation. Diamanias. Link. There is a person in a thick jacket sitting on a boat on the dark and stormy sea. Group, main. And as you can see, as I navigate to the first panel, we can already read the text. We could, for example, also say, navigation, okay, characters, let's actually navi article, um, landmarks, try to articles. just like, navigate through all the articles, because each panel is actually an article, and then you get like, a better idea how this actually will play out for a screen reader user. As you, for example, now on the first panel, you can now navigate to there the There is next a person panel. in a thick jacket sitting on a boat on the dark and stormy sea. The boat is rocking while the waves splash against it. Swoosh. Splash. You can also click like through the se several onotopia, so like the kind of like word sounds for different things in your actual panel once you declared like a um, semantic HTML. The waves continue shaking the boat, the person on the boat sitting in it motionless. The waves move further and further. The person on the boat is turning over their left shoulder, their face still unrecognizable in the dark and half covered with the hood of their jacket. Which way? And also speech bubbles actually become accessible by default once we actually do this. The person starts rowing through the sea, continuing their path backwards through the waves. And by making sure that each panel is actually transcribed well, we can also still embed all of the cool narrated experience into each panel and still have something that's a little bit more eye candy for like, the sighted users as well. And I think this is really nice to keep in mind. Voice over off. And as we now saw at this uh, example, there's already a lot of stuff um, that we can do for screen readers in general, but accessibility isn't only concerned about screen reader accessibility, but also a lot of like, other things that, for example, users with low vision or dyslexia might struggle with. If you, for example, think about this feature that a lot of like, mobile web apps nowadays have is that they try to make it impossible to actually zoom into your content. And what I would like to advise you is to really not make use of this, but instead actually allow your user to zoom into any content that they have. Um, if you actually make sure that you never set like, the maximum width of your content to a certain way, like even like someone with low vision can still make use of the cool and illustrative ways that you try to um, illustrate your comic uh, by themselves without yeah, having actually to use a screen reader, for example. And I think this is very important to keep in mind as well if you think about actually having your web comic available for mobile devices. Also, thinking about font sizes is, I think, quite standard and also quite easy to achieve once you actually stick to a rule of thumb, for example, making sure that all the font sizes in your web comic are at least like 16 pixels and also the contrast is something that comes into mind and can also be rather easily catched by a lot of accessibility tools that actually keep you in check in regards to the contrast that you find in your application. But let's also think outside of just uh, contrast and like font sizes and also how uh, screen readers actually access this in other parts. What kind of measures we actually have to take to make our webcomic experience really accessible. 
And in this regard, I actually want to tell you a short story, a story that really made me think about what I, as a developer, actually have to take care of once I create my own webcomic. And this story actually is later to be named as the Pokemon Shock Incident. Maybe can I get, get like a quick show of hands? Like, who maybe already has an idea here? Like, get your hands up, what this actually refers to. Okay, there's like one lonely hand over there. So, okay, everyone is in for a little bit of suspense. So, this story actually dates back quite a while ago, and maybe some of you have therefore also kind of like forgotten about it, but it has been a really big deal. Back then, in December 16th, 1997, there was quite a mysterious thing going on. Actually, a lot of children suddenly, like in this very evening and night of December the 16th, were admitted to hospitals in Japan. And in the beginning, it was not really clear what was going on. A lot of the children actually suffered from, yeah, kind of like dizziness, nausea, headaches. Sometimes they even lost their consciousness and had seizures. And the hospital staff and also the people that actually admitted the children to the hospital were wondering what this actually was about. And it all kind of like boiled down to one singular incident that combined all of the children's experience, which was they were actually watching a TV children's show just at this very evening before they got admitted to the hospital. So obviously everyone was like a little bit in panic and the TV stations who actually broadcasted this, like in Japan back then, they took the show down and actually did some investigation. They were like, okay, what, how can this actually be? Like there must be a connection, but what actually happened when the children watched this particular TV show? And they actually found that they aired this 38th episode of the first season of Pokemon, like a, a uh, children TV show, if you don't know it, about like um, people catching monsters and trying to let them fight against each other. And they found, while investigating the footage of this particular series, one scene that comes in maybe like 20 minutes into the episode. Of course, I'm not going, going to show the footage, it's not safe, but um, i just give you an estimation how it actually looked like. So in this particular scene, um, there's like a fight going on. It should be look super dramatic. And they decided, like the creators of the episode, to show kids like this one particular frame, like with a bright red color in the background interchangeably with another screen with a very bright blue background. And on top of this, they showed it like in a very high frequency. So they showed it like very fast, interchangeably, like with a very low, kind of like a very high heart rate. And for about six seconds, a lot of like children already experienced the symptoms of nausea, headaches, sometimes seizures, and loss of consciousness. And what you can see from this is, that the creation of this strobe light effect, this flashy light effect, actually had a very serious um, implication for a lot of children that sometimes were not even aware that they either suffered from photosensitive epilepsy or that they are at least susceptible to these kind of strobe light effects. And looking at the story, there's something that comes to our mind quite yeah, quite promptly, that um, if we think about accessibility, we also have to think about safety. And sometimes the users that actually yeah, consume our web apps or our art experiences might not even be aware until they are in the situation that they suffer from the consequences that they're actually sensitive to it. So my advice is, in general, to just like avoid any kind of strobe light effects because you can never be sure that your users are actually aware and even a content warning will not save them from that if they just realize in this very moment. Apart from safety, also a lot of other things come into mind when we build web applications that should be accessible. Keyboard accessibility, color contrast, we also had a look at it, semantic HTML, are a great way to make it accessible for everyone. But also, if you want to help screen reader users to actually navigate our pages, correct heading hierarchy, landmarks, and also page navigation come into play. And page navigation, I think, is something we might never really think about when we build uh, 90s-style kind of server-side rendered pages. But once we actually get in the area of building single-page applications, it becomes also really important. Because at the end of the day, we actually rely on the framework or the libraries that we're using to actually provide a lot of functionality for us to emulate experiences from server-side rendered pages that might not be available anymore in the single side page JavaScript client side world. And things, for example, when we um, change a route and change a page in a single page application, like um, 
URL updates are very informative for a sighted user, but for someone who uses a screen reader, it might not be so apparent that a page navigation actually has occurred. And in many different frameworks that you might work in, there are already solutions for it. I want to highlight one solution that is available in the Ember community and want to talk about how you can apply something similar as well, like in any kind of other JavaScript stack. In Ember, for example, we have one add-on that's called Ember CLI Document Title that helps you to update the meta title of your page, so the kind of title that you also will later on see in the tab of your page. And this in itself is not so yeah, useful for uh, screener users, obviously, but what it um, helps is with actually tracking what kind of title um, is actually on when like, a user enters a certain route and helps you to kind of like, manage this as you create certain routes or sub-pages of the application. And using this one, in, ex in addition with the plugin uh, Accessibility Announcer, we actually now have a way to, uh, for example, insert a component, the route announcer component that's provided by the plugin, into our application template, which will make sure that any time a page navigation actually occurred in our application, an area live attribute on an element that is rendered at all times in our application is updated with the title of the page. And therefore, this is always announced to every screen reader, like area live text can be used in this way to actually announce these kind of dynamic changes to screen reader users to make sure that even a blind reader might be possible to realize, oh, I actually got back to the home page now, so uh, maybe let's get a better get back to reading the comic. And last but not least, I also want to take a few moments to think about accessibility on a more high level and why, yeah, why are you actually all here and to actually listen to this talk? Because you might think like, well, we're already doing so many strides in actually bringing accessibility to the web, so why, why is this like such a big focus in this talk? And here I want to focus on some of yeah, maybe the one biggest takeaway I actually had from a talk that I recently saw by Melanie Sumner, who's like an accessibility ad advocate and also a senior software engineer at LinkedIn, who talked about us trying to not break the web. And there, for example, they highlighted the survey results or the investigation results of the VEX Accessibility in Mind organization, which actually made an effort to look at the one million most popular home pages. So, Facebook.com, Google.com, Instagram.com, um, I don't know. Think about all the other one million most popular pages that are probably out there right now on the web. And try to find out how many of the home pages, so the very first page that the user actually enters, are actually accessible. How many of them actually are bug-free in regards to accessibility? And the results were actually quite striking because what they found is that of the 1 million pages they investigated, 2.2% actually didn't have any accessibility errors regarding to the VEC content accessibility guidelines, which give you an idea about color contrast and font sizes and what you should actually do in your page to make it accessible. And the astounding rest of almost 98% of websites was, in regards to accessibility, broken. And this is something that, at least for me as a site developer, is kind of surprising. I kind of go like, well, like these pages don't seem that broken to me. But once I actually try to navigate the web with a screen reader alone, with my screen unplugged, I realize, yeah, maybe there's like another story to that. And in this context, I would like to encourage you to make use of automated tools that actually help you to find out if the pages that you build and the applications you build are still on top of everything in regards to accessibility. And Xcore, for example, is a great library that you can install into your application. Or maybe you also have an add-on similar in your open source community that provides you with this, that helps you to actually audit any kind of um, accessibility concerns in your application easily and also keeps track of regressions as you keep on building this application. And I also would like to encourage you to practice empathy because I think this is actually the most important point why um, we nowadays still struggle with accessibility concerns. It's not so much that the tools are not there or it's not so much that we don't know how it works. It's more like we at some point need to realize it really is a priority 
even if the legislation is not there yet, even if our users don't write us uh, 1,000 emails every day to say, well, something is broken, because, yeah, there are a lot of people out there who cannot use the web right now, and I think we are at a place right now where we can change so much about it. In this context, to actually gain an understanding, I would encourage you to actually do manual accessibility testing. And even if it's just for having the experience for yourself, actually go to a website or something that you built yourself and get a screen reader. Like on Mac, you can just do voiceover, as I, saw on, uh, as I showed in the demo. But NVDA Chromeworks are also like free solutions you can just use out of the box, for example, for Windows. And once you actually have the screen reader ready, unplug your screen. And actually try to go to your favorite websites and try to use something. Try to navigate. Try to actually do the things that you do on the daily. And maybe have an experience where you go like, huh, like this is surprising. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have thought. It's actually not that straightforward. And I believe with this understanding, we really have a chance to learn more about what we need to do in regards to accessibility. But last but not least, I also want to highlight, if you want to learn more about manual um, accessibility testing, a blog post that I wrote, like a quick intro into how to, for example, use voiceover. And also, last but not least, I want to highlight that you can do so many cool things on the web uh, in regards to art experiences, webcomic experiences. But most importantly, if there's anything that you could take away from this talk, is that if we actually make a commitment to accessibility. We can build not only really cool art experiences and really cool comics for literally everyone, we can literally build anything on the web for everyone. And we have the means and the chance to do this today. And with this said, thank you very much, and have a great time at ReactiveConf.